Matt, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Great. Right. Looks like you have a nice turnout there. Good to be uh, talking to you guys here in Angular, D.C. Uh, currently here in Colorado, it's uh, snowing again. It snowed every night for the last seven days. Um, but uh, tonight, I want to talk to you about uh, Angular architecture, uh, effective architecture, and then uh, uh, some concepts from clean architecture, which has uh, been a topic uh, that's been around for a good number of years now. And I think with uh, the new capabilities of the uh, Angular workspace with library projects and uh, the capabilities of TypeScript, object-oriented programming uh, language, uh, we have a lot of things that we can do now that uh, we could not uh, do before or as easily before uh, the last couple of years or even longer. So uh, anyway, that's what we're going to uh, get into. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Matt Vaughn. Uh, you can uh, uh, connect with me on Twitter at uh, Angularlicious or uh, my email address. I'll share my screen. Email address, uh, Matt at Angularlicious. So architecture, it's a pretty big topic, and I think um, – it, it means a lot of different things, but what I've done in the last uh, year or so, uh, because I've, I've spent a lot of time putting some thoughts and ideas together in the Angular Architecture book, is I've kind of distilled it down into uh, three different areas. Uh, the first area is uh, experience, uh, which which uh, is more about the people, and then uh, the essentials is the second area, which is uh, talking about the tools and materials that really need to be considered as part of uh, architecture and uh, the, the design process. And then last but not least, the execution phase and how that relates to architecture and the tools that we choose and such. So with that, uh, we, we know when we think of architecture in general, a lot of people think of uh, some of the amazing structures that have been uh, in the world for centuries of time or even thousands of years. And we really marvel at this because we think the uh, creators and builders of these things uh, just didn't start building this magnificent temple or the Eiffel Tower. Uh, they started with a design and a plan. And the design and plan probably had to take in, uh, to consideration many different things. And um, when they do this, uh, they're able to be uh, to be very effective and to deliver something that's going to really stand the test of time and to last uh, uh, for uh, even centuries and such. So when we think of effective architecture, uh, experience is really uh, people having the right knowledge and understanding of, of the domain, uh, having uh, the expertise in software programming and engineering concepts and principles. But it also means uh, being able to perform analysis, design, and planning. And uh, sometimes I think this might be a uh, missing step from uh, uh, the process in terms of uh, the software development lifecycle. Uh, it could be that uh, some teams or individuals on teams or just even yourself as uh, just a developer of a team of one, um, we just start coding because uh, that's what we're comfortable doing. And we um, often don't spend enough time uh, doing the analysis and design and planning. So really, I think that um, should be driven by um, everyone on a team, including even developers. So it really doesn't need to be a lead developer or an architect on your team. Uh, it should be something that uh, we all do together and, and think about. So if you're not doing it or not doing enough of it, then maybe that's something uh, your teams could uh, kind of uh, talk about and see if there's a way to get better at doing that. And so in regard to that, uh, technical leadership is certainly key uh, within the development team. Uh, technical leadership uh, can help uh, influence and drive and help mentor and uh, help kind of mediate things and move things forward and have more of a, uh, uh, a big picture of, uh, of what's going on and such. So one of the things that uh, happens uh, during the uh, analysis and design phase or should be happening is the consideration of your tools and materials. And the, the one reason why I bring that up is that the consideration of what you're going to use to build your software, your application, um, what platform you're going to use, Angular, uh, are you going to use a third-party control suite? Um, is it going to require NGRX for state management or some other uh, mechanism to do that? Um, 
Are you going to have charts and graphs? So uh, you might need a charting control suite, things like that. So if you do not consider the tools and materials uh, during the analysis and design and select those, then considering how you develop or plan your features um, uh, are going to be impacted by that. So uh, for example, um, I just joined a team uh, about eight months ago or 10 months ago now, time flies fast. And there were no third party control suites uh, selected for this tool. So what happened was the developer created a grid, a table and that table wasn't even implemented as a control. It was basically that code was copied from one component to another component, et cetera, et cetera. And so as developers, you're probably thinking, ah, that's not going to turn out so, so good. And uh, after two and a half years of development, when you have all these tables throughout the entire application and each one of them is a snowflake, it really becomes hard to manage and maintain um, because there's a lack of consistency there. So really a consideration of a control suite that maybe had a grid uh, control would have uh, solved a lot of those problems and such. Okay, so uh, last but not least, uh, the execution phase is uh, really uh, the implementation, uh, the development, but how are you going to develop? Um, so I think it's really effective if during the analysis and design phase that there's actually a documented plan, um, even even recipes or prototypes or even a playbook uh, that could be established uh, for uh, the development team that actually demonstrates how things are going to work. Um, how are we going to uh, communicate between components or how are we going to provide messages from our services or from the back end uh, and how are we going to display those to our users uh, in, our, in our business applications? Um, just simple things like that when we think about it. Um, if we don't talk about it or they're not part of our design, uh, really these problems emerge as we're developing these different features and such, and we may not uh, implement them um, as effectively as uh, we, we could have if uh, they were part of uh, our design and planning. So if a team has uh, come up with a playbook and a plan and they've uh, been able to go through and uh, through their analysis, they uh, define the, the many fe features of an application. Um, it also affects how they execute. So let's uh, say, for example, um, you don't plan, you don't know what the features are for the application or you have a very general sense of it. Um, the application I was just talking about recently, um, when I showed up, it had about um, 30, 25 to 30 uh, services and about 50 to 60 components. And all of the services and all of the components were in the single app module uh, of the application. So one module, basically one giant bundle uh, when you built the application with all of the uh, services and all of the components in one, um, one uh, bundle. So it took over 10 seconds for the application to load in the browser. So that's not very effective or a good experience for our users. And sometimes when the app is loading, you wondered if it was actually broke because it took so long for it to load up. So with a little planning and design, you can figure out that I have like a set of features. Um, I have my shipments, I have orders, I have customers, I have my account features. And if we're using the capabilities or understand the tools and materials uh, that we're working with with Angular, we have the ability to create uh, application modules that really organize and separate our code into these distinct verticals and each module for like the shipments, orders, and customers, and products basically have everything contained in the modules that uh, are related to that specific feature. So it allows uh, for better code organization and things like that. So when we think about uh, how important analysis and design is, it could really affect even the execution if we don't really uh, spend the time to figure out what it is we're actually building and then organize in our code in, in such a way. And then the last item there, the last bullet point is basically guarding the code as a team and making sure that uh, if we are doing these feature type development that we're organizing and keeping things in the right place if we're going to do a layered architecture approach like we're talking about tonight, um, we're making sure that we respect the boundaries between the layers and things like that. So um, we'll get a little more detail here in just a little bit. So architecture does matter. Um, 
what I'm going to uh, show to, uh, show you guys tonight is the uh, a clean uh, architecture approach um, and such. And a clean architecture approach is really just kind of a um, implementation of several principles that have been around for um, many many years. Um, it really relies heavily on uh, clean uh, clean code principles like separation of concerns, single responsibility. Uh, clear boundaries between each layer and each layer has a specific boundary and then uh, trying as hard as possible uh, not to duplicate your code so we don't repeat ourselves uh, we we don't copy and paste code uh, between components or between layers and things like that <coughs> excuse me so uh, Clean code, clean architecture is going to uh, heavily rely on uh, some specific design patterns and even some object-oriented uh, principles and practices that uh, we can now take advantage of because we're using TypeScript, which allows us to have uh, uh, interfaces. Uh, we can have uh, abstract classes, base classes, uh, and all these things can participate in uh, polymorphism and inheritance and uh, all those object-oriented things uh, that we're used to. So clean architecture is really uh, taking advantage of uh, uh, layers and boundaries and, interestingly, uh, dependency injection. Uh, so inversion of control is uh, in implementation of that. And so one of the main uh, reasons for clean architecture and the goals is to have a very testable uh, application or solution so that you can uh, have higher quality and such. And uh, being able to organize our code better in these, these layers will uh, enable us uh, to do that. Um, we've, we've heard about layered architecture and tier. I think that's really what clean architecture is. Uh, there have been some variations of it uh, over the years. Uh, if you're interested in kind of doing some research on yourself, uh, hexagonal architecture is very interesting. Uh, onion architecture is a layered approach that kind of has uh, presentation layers on the outside and then all the layers going towards the center, towards uh, your, uh, your business and data. Okay, so here is a diagram that uh, shows us at a high level uh, the layers that we're going to be working with. Um, so uh, it, if you think about this, it's almost like a three-tier layer. We've got our presentation layer um, at the top. Uh, we've got a business layer, and we have uh, our data access, which uh, in our Angular applications, we're going to use an HTTP client, and we're going to be making uh, web API calls uh, through the internet to, to web APIs on the back end. So that's pretty standard, but uh, there's a slight variation here that I want to uh, make, uh, make you aware of. So I'm going to pull up uh, this other diagram here just to blow it up a little bit and talk about it. So... In the UI layer, typically we have uh, components that use a, a service, and that's kind of how we do our abstraction. And we say that our components are really for presentation, meaning that the responsibility is to collect information and to display information. And it will use a service to basically uh, uh, perform the operations to retrieve data and to persist data. But what I've seen in a lot of uh, Angular applications uh, during the last couple of years is that this component service kind of architecture um, really gets uh, overloaded on the service part. Uh, the service really uh, becomes responsible for a lot of things. And so um, before that, early on, you would see a lot of this code implemented directly in the component. So the component would be responsible for um, uh, retrieving uh, the data, uh, using HTTP client, uh, perhaps doing some validation of inputs, uh, handling the response coming back uh, from the API request, uh, perhaps subscribing to that observable, and then getting that data and then setting that data in a property that it can be exposed to the front end and, and such. So, and if there are any errors during that processing, then it would also be responsible for that as well. So when we think of that kind of approach, uh, it's not very uh, well organized or orchestrated or single responsibility. You put 
everything in kind of one place. So then services uh, started being used to kind of take that load off components. But then what we really did is just basically move a lot of that code into a service. So then we have these services that are very overloaded. And we don't have a really distinct uh, business layer uh, where we can uh, do things like uh, business logic or um, uh, business rules or data validation and things like that. So one of the things that I've done, and we'll look at the code that shows this, is we still create a, a service in the um, application or in the, the feature module, but the responsibility of that service is more of a uh, adapter, a mediator between your business layer and the UI layer. And what happens when we do this, it allows us to basically uh, uh, coordinate, do more coordination, but it takes all of the uh, business logic responsibilities and the data access, HTTP processing, handling of observables and uh, errors, error handling from API requests from this service and moves it down into uh, other layers where each layer basically will handle their, um, their responsibilities. So, what I want to do now is I'll, I'll go into um, a, an application. So here we have uh, a simple uh, application that's going to show these uh, these cards with a list of uh, courses that uh, you can click on. So if you can view the course, some information, and and then some videos about each of the courses and such. And so this uh, uh, component. Uh, the courses component is uh, displayed here. So let me, uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen and someone could raise your hand. Can you see the code okay? Does it need to be a little larger? You can see the code? All right. Looks All right. good, Matt. Okay, great. So notice in this uh, in this latest courses component, there's really not, not a lot of code here. In fact, uh, there's no code. The component, you don't see any code here in the component where it's actually uh, retrieving the data or any HTTP code. Um, no URLs are here for the web API. Uh, there's no business logic or anything uh, in this uh, component. And so when we look at the uh, actual HTTP, uh, of the, the template, we just have uh, an async observable. So we don't even have, uh, we don't even need to use a, uh, a subscription here because the async observable takes, takes care of that for us. So uh, taking this kind of a, a layered approach and, and moving things into a layered approach really kind of simplifies not only your, your uh, views or your templates, but your component uh, that supports that. And then uh, we'll take a look at the service that is uh, actually retrieving this data. So we have a UI service, and that's the same that we uh, see here in this UI layer. Uh, this UI service is uh, located in this feature module. So I just want to show you that I have a, a feature module called Courses. And... And here's the courses uh, uh, UI uh, service. Um, hold on here. Courses UI service. So let's get. It will find it. Okay. So here's our courses UI service in the courses module.